today's session, we're looking deeply in at what's introduced in section 6.4 of the book, a fundamental misconception that sweeps through pretty much all of economics, all of business studies about how the world works whenever anything is coming in that is about random chance, good fortune or bad fortune. And this is something that actually has very, very deep consequences for investors who are using a portfolio approach to investment, for business leaders who are taking decisions about what profit margin is necessary to lead to a certain level of business performance. This fundamental misconception leads to portfolios that fail, business strategies that take the company into the ground. And perhaps worst of all, it leads to blame games, superficial fudges and fixes that are actually repairing something that is being caused by a fundamental misunderstanding of how the world works. And the, the big fancy technical word for it is whether the world is ergodic or non-ergodic. And we can talk about that a bit more in the moment. So diving into what this means, um, if I were to offer you the following situation, you have, I have a coin, I toss the coin, and if it lands heads, the amount of money you have in your bank account grows by 50%. And if it lands tails, the amount of money you have in your bank account decreases by 40%. You can think of this as a bit like a business proposition. You are selling something to a client and you have a 50-50 probability that the client pays or doesn't pay. If the client pays, your company bank balance grows by 50%. If the client doesn't pay, it decreases by 40%, which was your cost of sale. Do you take the deal? So most people who've taken a statistics course will recognize that those numbers lead to an average 5% growth rate. So if you repeat it often enough, you will win at an average 5% growth rate. So it's economically rational to take that deal. However, as those of you who've read the blog will know, and those of you who know me and the kind of questions I pose, what normal statistics tells you is economically rational is actually false in this situation. If we take a look at what actually happens, this is a simulation of exactly this situation across 100 companies. Each company starting off at a thousand euros bank balance and tossing that coin 365 times, which represents, let's say, one year of sales cycles, or this could represent 100 companies in a portfolio. <clears throat> the dotted line moving up, let me just make a slight modification. So the dotted line up there is the 5% growth rate that normal statistics says you should expect from a completely balanced coin being tossed at random. Half of them fall heads, half of them fall tails, 50% gain per head, 40% loss per tail. It's 5% benefit on average for every coin toss. That dotted line going up is exactly what you would get if a hundred people each tossed the coin once completely separately. 
the lines that you see, the gray lines is coming from a simulation of a hundred companies starting at a thousand. Each company tosses the coin in succession 365 times. And what you see is by the end, 365 times, 92% of the companies have already gone bankrupt. If I were to continue it down to a thousand, pretty much every single company will have gone bankrupt. In this case, the expectation value is this black dosh dat line over here. What this in essence is saying is that in this kind of situation, the normal statistics is fundamentally wrong. If you continue with this gamble for long enough, you will never get to that dotted 5% growth line. You will get closer and closer to this dash dot loss line, which is 5.1% loss per throw on average. The reason behind that is that if things are connected, a different way of calculating needs to be used. Each of these coin tosses is connected across time. What that leads to is that on average 5% loss, not 5% gain. Jackson are talking to in a minute about the fundamentals of what this means for statistics, or at least from the economics perspective. What it means for investors, for example, if you're investing in a portfolio and the numbers look like this, in other words, there's a strong domination from good or bad fortune, you're going to end up losing money across your portfolio when you think you should gain money. Or put a different way, the risk in a portfolio is significantly higher than most people realize using normal statistics because their statistics predicts that dotted line up there, when in reality, it's this dash dot line here that dominates. As I say, the reason behind that is this connection across time. What is also built into here is that if the company hits 10 cents left in their bank account, it goes bankrupt. So there's a, a hard cut off there. The alternative that we have found and that is backed up by some solid recent statistical calculations from 2016, if instead of having a portfolio, you structure as an ecosystem of companies. This is what you get. And the more the companies hang together as an ecosystem, the closer they get to the, the dotted average that you would expect from naive statistics. What's inside this particular simulation is that after every coin toss, the companies that got lucky and grew by 50%, share 1% of their winnings with all of the companies in the ecosystem. So at about 50% win, 50% lose, that means that each company that wins 50% shares on average half a percent of their winning with the companies that didn't win that cycle. And you can see that just that level of collaboration of sharing winnings fundamentally changes the dynamics of an ecosystem of companies. In this case, even the worst company is getting close to the performance of the best company up here. So if we want to have, oh, by the way, that solid red line is the average and the dotted red line over there is the median. This is the middle company the company exactly at number 50 in, in the range is on the dotted line. So the essence of what this shows is that the kind of 
business ecosystem that we're proposing in Rebuild, where all of the companies are incorporated in a way that includes all capitals, all stakeholders, where there is a sharing between all of the companies that are involved with each other of dividends and capital gain, fundamentally transforms the financial performance of the entire group of companies and every single individual companies from the perspective of pure luck. In addition to this comes anything that is actually being done well by the business leaders to drive business performance forwards. This is also pointing at the importance of unconditional basic income and a whole host of other factors. Before we hand over to Jack, I'll put in a couple of other bits of information. So, um, one of the things that comes out of this is that if you are in the kind of processes you've just seen, in order to hit the growth rate or that 5% growth rate that normal stats would predict. In other words, if you want to hit this dotted line up there, using this portfolio approach or as a single company, what you actually need is not the 50% gain per head. You need an 83.8% gain at 40% loss to hit that 5% actual growth rate. So you can see here, businesses who are using the statistical thinking that is taught in business schools and in economics to calculate a rational price point are seriously short in terms of everything that has any measure of luck involved. And this is really important if you think also of the research of Paul Ormerod. Paul Ormerod's work showed that the, the only explanation that really fits business failure is random misfortune, bad luck. All of the other explanations don't fit the data sufficiently well. And that is enough evidence that the role of luck is sufficiently big in business that what we're showing here as a pure luck model has at least some relevance to the decisions that we're taking, whether we're taking them as an investor or as a startup founder or whatever. Um, and the other thing that I was saying, I'm not sure whether you got it, is that if all of the companies are independent as a portfolio, or it's one single company by itself, rather than in a collaborative ecosystem, to get a 5% growth rate, you need to have an 83.8% gain at each winning coin toss, not 50%. And only at that level of profit margin is it rational to take the deal and expect a 5% growth rate. So that's the basis of it. Jack, you want to say a few words about the economics? Um, yeah, I would love to. Uh, I would just like to mention that I'm not involved with CIA, uh, so I don't think I will be disappearing, which is good. Um, I would just like to say welcome to everybody. It's just really, really just deeply, viscerally, uh, very, very exciting just to work with you and to witness and dialogue and all of that. Uh, I will be needing to be leaving a little bit early, and the reason being I'm, I'm actually teaching this stuff that we're criticizing. <laughs> Although, you know, the, the university mandates, well, I have to teach it this way. And um, I will have to be leaving a little bit early. It's early in the morning, and I'm teaching a little bit later. But um, I would also like to just mention that ergodicity is, is if, if, if you're not able to really get I would, I would not be a little bit angry at myself. This is something that is relatively new. And there's a lot of work that we're doing 
and it, we're, we're, we're doing our best to understand uh, the use of this and what it means. And this is almost, in, in my perspective, it's you know, almost a little bit like general relativity. It's very, very critical, although it isn't easy to grasp. And actually, let me give an example. I know Graham um, did a good job of laying it out, but I think this, this might be a simple example. Uh, most of our decisions in life are a gamble, meaning we're, we're doing something, but we don't know exactly you know, what the outcome is or will be, and we don't know specifically what the problem is even going to be. You know, we do this when we go to school, when we're looking, when we're looking for a mate, and even more mundane things, even going out, particularly nowadays. Um, the, the simple example that I would like to give is Russian roulette. And this is not something that I would recommend, and forgive me for using the gun metaphor, but you know, the essence of this game, I guess it is a game, but it is a gamble, is that um, there is a one bullet, and then there's six chambers. And then if you're if you're doing this game with six people, which I would not recommend at all, then you could you could statistically figure out the odds. And the odds are re relatively re reasonable. Um, one bullet, six people, uh, the odds are relatively good. And, and doing the probability and the expected value, you might even get a decision, you know, go with it. Particularly if there's money uh, that will be given to the winner. But if an individual does this and does all six, um, the individual will be, will be dead. And I think that's, that really gets at the essence. Uh, what, what ergodicity means is, you know, if we look at the expected value of each person doing um, the Russian roulette with one bullet and uh, uh, six people, the odds are pretty good. But if an individual does that, then the odds are zero that that individual will survive. And what ergodicity means is that if we look at the ensemble, meaning the average uh, of the six people and their probability, that would equal the, the, this average over time of one individual. And that situation, they're obviously not equal. And meaning that situation isn't ergodic but it's non it. And the difference is that, you know, we live in time and this is the way we operate. And even given us this average probability that there's one in six, really, it really doesn't matter that much with the individual. You know, if the individual is going over this, over time, it's very, very different um, situation. And, the, the difficulty, as uh, Graham mentioned, and it is a misconception, but this misconception is deeply rooted. And it's so deeply rooted that um, most of us aren't even aware of it. And the last couple of weeks, I've been doing some research in economics books, and then uh, also a lot of other writings, and there isn't any mention of this. In most economics books, you know, we're actually teaching this um, as if, as if uh, there is no difference, and there is a significant difference. And most situations in life are not ergodic, but we're we're in economics at basic finance. We're teaching as if they are ergodic, and I think the best way to at least for me uh, to keep this. Um, this distinguishing um, aspect of this is Russian, Russian roulette. And that's a basic idea, which could be extended um, elsewhere. Just briefly, the essence of the book Rebuild, as a reminder for those who've been in the previous webinars, and as an 
brief summary for those who haven't, the focus or one focus of the book Rebuild is how do you build business ecosystems that are inherently designed to sit at the sweet spot that nature lives at between collaboration and competition. Many of you will already have come across this axis going up there, which is the axis of how work is organized. Things like holacracy, sociocracy sit over there. And we, in this book, show how it's necessary to actually go beyond what they can do to a point where the company itself is able to create new companies or decide to end its own life, etc. For that to work well, it needs to be integrated with human processes, things like Keegan's deliberately developmental organization or our extension of that that we call the Evolute 6 adaptive way. And again, there it's necessary to get companies to the point level five where development is a core purpose of the company. And the third axis, which is how the company is incorporated. In other words, how it brings in the stakeholders and how it harnesses the tension between stakeholders and between the different capitals as a source of strength and growth for the company. And what we show clearly in the book is that if you want to have psychological safety at work, if you want to have self-management at work, you cannot do it in any thing other than a highly fragile way if you're incorporated as a limited company. A cooperative is pretty much the bare minimum, but if you really want to get the benefits that we're talking about here of this kind of whole ecosystem growth and the anti-fragility that every single company in the ecosystem here displays against misfortune, then you need to actually have an incorporation that goes all the way up to what we call level five. And at the level five incorporation, all of the other companies in the ecosystem have an appropriate level of legally anchored and protected governance rights in each other and a share of the wealth generated by each other company at an appropriate level. They can trust each other over the long term as an ecosystem because each has governance rights in the other company. So the trust is not based on relatively fragile contracts that where you don't have much actual involvement in what's happening. The trust is based on the fact that everybody is actually part of everybody else's general meeting governance decisions. That leads to what I call a deep ecosystem rather than a shallow ecosystem or even worse, a portfolio. So that's the essence behind everything. And I would suggest we now just dive into discussions, questions and answers, and I will kick off. I know Donna has asked a question, so perhaps Donna, you would put your question into words for everybody to hear, and then we can dive into it. Okay, I've got a few questions and some of it, um, full disclosure, I, attempted statistics on more than one occasion and never got through it. So I have no, mm. um, my brain does not work. I just have this sense that there's some gold here. So bear with me. Um, I'm trying to understand the significance of this and a couple of things. If, if this is so, uh, why has it not surfaced sooner? And moreover, uh, I'm going to put this in the vernacular because I've got some, and I think some other people here do as well, some real needs uh, to understand how to use this. And even if that will take a bit of time and some additional investment of time to get a sense of how practical this will be to apply sooner than later. Not everybody's going to read the book. And those of us that are out there with, 
as we put it, boots on the ground, trying to um, bring this stuff into the world um, are looking for ways to do so sooner than later. And I know we've had these kind of conversations before, Graham. So um, I'm just trying to kind of cut through um, as best I can. And it could be that you, Graham and Jack and anybody else here might have some insights around that. So I'll, I'll shut up and listen. Thank you, Donna. I'll, I'll put in a couple of thoughts. I'll begin, begin with the final, the final bit. All that somebody needs to get is that collaboration makes really good sense. Whether you believe in altruism or whatever, just from pure numbers, collaboration makes really good sense. So, you know, if you're using a, if you're in some business that is structured towards collaboration, you're better off than you if you're in pure competition. And this, the beauty of this, for people who are numbers oriented and who couldn't care less about values, ethics, or whatever, this is the first time I've ever seen a pure numbers argument that shows why collaboration is good. You know, biologists are all over this over the past few years because it shows why single celled organisms will begin to collaborate without any of the normal arguments that biology has historically used around specialization or whatever as a rationale for collaboration. Why hasn't this been done before? Well, it, there's, a, there's actually a relatively simple reason. The foundations of economic thinking and the use of probability in economics goes back 300, 400 years. Those are the roots of it. Physics understood or observed that the real world was behaving differently to the theories of physics, the old theories of physics over a century ago. And what physicists realized was that the naive statistics doesn't work to describe the real world. And there's a simple reason. Naive statistics is based on adding things up. Naive statistics says each coin toss is separate. So if you want to get the average, you add them all up and you divide by the total number of coin tosses. What is in um, the lower graph over, or what is actually happening in these graphs is multiply not add. If on the first coin toss, I gain 50% and the next coin toss, I lose 40%, I have to multiply by 0.6. And if I say, so additive statistics would say, um, actually 1.5 is what you multiply with to get a 50% gain. Additive statistics is 1.5, plus 0.6 equals 2.1 divided by two is 1.05 is a 5% growth. What's actually happening, if a single company is tossing the coin 365 times in succession, that is 1.5 times by 0.9 and repeated 365 times. 1.5 times by point. 1.5 times by 0.6 is 0.9, which means at an individual toss, it's the square root of 0.9, which is just 0.9, it's 0.949 approximately. And that's why in any kind of sequential process where things are connected, what would naively look like growth actually turns into loss. And the thing is, my life is a sequence of events. They happen one after the other. The uh, right approach is to multiply the probabilities from start to end of my life, not to just add them up and then take the average. 
And this is something, the understanding of this only emerged in physics about, as I say, a little over a hundred years ago, that the average across a large number of completely independent events does not need to be the same as the same number of events happening in a sequence. And that difference is what's, if they are equal, it's what's called ergodic. If they're not equal, it's what's called non-ergodic. Um, and as to why this hasn't emerged in economics yet, well, Jack's in a better position to answer that. What I can say is that the first research- I, I, I... Jack? Yeah, I, I can just, um, oh, no, I didn't want to cut you off. Just, you were about to say something. Just going to say that the first research papers only started emerging a decade ago, and a key paper only emerged yeah. a couple of years ago on this. Can I just jump in yeah. for one yeah. second? Yeah. Let me just jump in for one second. Um, uh, I'm not sure I will fully understand the mathematical side of this, and I'm not sure I will even need to, and others here might well um, have the, um, uh, the ability to follow it and the need to understand it in that kind of detail. Um, there's, a, there's gonna be a follow-on question for me, which is, let's say this is true. Let's just accept for a moment, um, and we don't need to go there yet, but uh, I just want you to know where I'm headed. Let's say this is true, then, What's the significance? And given that we are dealing with human beings who have been used to doing things for a certain way for so long in terms of governance models and, and um, inv investments, et cetera, um, I'm going to be especially interested in the so what? What do we do with this? Um, so I just wanted to plop that in there. But by all means, Jack, you know, um, go back and answer that question because I and I don't know how much of that question is a burning question for others. But in a short answer, Jack, uh, yes, I'll touch uh, on so what? Well, yeah, yeah, that that works. Uh, first of all, Donna, I really appreciate that about about your difficulty with statistics. Mm -hmm. I have a doctorate in economics, and I remember my statistics uh, when I took that as an undergraduate. It was a nightmare. I had a really bad professor. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't get it. And the professor didn't get that I didn't get it. And um, that it, it's, it's I, I do get oh, that. Oh, dear, we've um, lost Jack. Now, Jack. Oh, Jack, come back. We love uh, you. Wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Actually, it's OK Am for I me to hear you. Yep. Jack I'm still, still here. here. I'm still Am here. I back? Jack, you're there. Still here. Yes. Uh, I don't there. Know. You're there, Jack. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, that, that's good. And I, I just, uh, I don't know what was missing, but I, I just mentioned about Donna that I, I empathize. I do get that, 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 you know, statistics, it might be, there might be this built-in, this built-in uh, obstacle that you know, a lot of us just don't get. Um, th this is a really, really good question that you asked, uh, and why wasn't it, uh, well, why didn't I think about this? Why didn't this surface earlier? That's a really good question. It's something that I'm working on. I'm going back in the history of economic thinking. And I've noticed that there are bits and pieces of, of this notion of ergodicity that surfaces up, it bubbles up, but then it's extirpated. And the, 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 the main direction of economics goes on without it. And I don't know the reason that it's extirpated, but uh, it, it's it's uh, it's something that I'm working on to go back and look at the roots of this and the roots of other people making arguments that yes, this ergodicity does exist, although we didn't use that word till recently. And I'm just working on that. <laughs> but with most economics, which is you know really really sad. But that's very, very typical is that there is, there is this tendency of basically to ignore other developments in math, in science, in physics, 
And it's it's as if economics is way, way back in the 18th century. This is something that we're working on to uh, redo. That's the best I can do to answer that. Thanks, Jack. A couple of brief things on the so what, and then I'll come to Sarah in a moment for your what you want to bring in. And after Sarah, Paul Mooney, and then Steve Cook. So two brief so what's. If you compare 100 companies in an ecosystem to 100 companies in a portfolio, if we want to tackle the climate catastrophe and we can have an investment in 100 regenerative startups where every single one of those startups performs as well or better than the outperforming companies in a portfolio, we have a thousand to a million times more power to deal with the climate catastrophe with exactly the same amount of investment at the beginning. The other so what for, for startups and their investors, this up here looks a lot like a traditional venture capitalist strategy. You rely on one unicorn to deliver almost all of the returns and you accept that about 90% of the companies go bankrupt or you shut them down because they're not performing. And this really illustrates that that approach is fundamentally chosen because of a deep misunderstanding of how real processes work in business. And that actually, if we constructed businesses as collaborative competitive ecosystems this way, even the worst company in your ecosystem will deliver better returns than the best company in your portfolio. And for me, this is, this is phenomenal. This is, as I say, this is how you, can you unleash a million times more power how can you get all of the ESG impact, whatever outcomes you want, and deliver better financial returns on investment? You know, th this is, I've always been for the past 12 years trying to figure out how can we fundamentally change the games so that we never have to compromise between financial profit versus regeneration, impact outcomes, ESG. And what's in the book, Rebuild, um, also in Robert Delner's book, who's on the call, you know, he's written this book on integral impact investing. This is what we're all after. How do you get these outcomes? And so we, we've built the approaches based on our understanding of what works. And what I love about this is that with pure numbers, this now illustrates why what all of us who've been open to ethical leadership, conscious capitalism, et cetera, the things that we've seen work, this now has a solid underpinning. They work because it taps into how the world really works and what gets taught in business schools and economic studies is fundamentally flawed. It does not describe how the world really works. So we, Sarah, does that cover what you wanted to say? Uh, thank you, uh, Graham, and thanks for this whole uh, very interesting presentation. I, I guess my question, um, because my market finance courses date back to 10 years ago, so I won't dive into too much details. I, I'd have a question more on, uh, we had the question of so what? I, I'd have a question linked rather to the know what, uh, saying like, do you, I mean, this whole changing the CAPM model, whether, and I think many people start to agree that it's broken um, is a need. However, that's a very huge work. And so my question would be, are you working for currently with um, leading universities focused on uh, market finance uh, or with, for example, there is a long-term stock exchange launched by Eric Ries, uh, on reinventing um, the market uh, asset finance uh, because changing the basis of uh, what's currently market finance is quite a, a huge work. So I guess uh, there's a need for some uh, 
some, for some collaboration with uh, large influencers. So I'd be curious uh, about your answer. So first of all, you're absolutely spot on. Yeah. This is ripe for oh. collaboration across all kinds of large influencers. So anything that you want to pick up and run with, there is an open invitation to pick it up and run with it. What we're already doing, you know, Jack's in academia, so there's some stuff that he's working on. My but, focus- But just don't hold that against me. <laughs> we won't, we won't. I just said, don't hold that against me. That's the way I make my living. <laughs> my, but I do a good job of teaching them the way the world really works. Indeed. My, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I had to add that in. No worries. Um, my focus is uh, very much on the side of creating more and more evidence grassroots up by incorporating business ecosystems using this approach that naturally leads to this kind of collaborative growth and finding investors that are willing to put the kind of investment behind those ecosystems so that we can rapidly get to a point where we have tens, if not hundreds of startups that are incorporated as fair shares commons and really get proof in money and impact outcomes that this truly is a, a powerful strategy to move forwards with. Sarah. Yeah, maybe then I'm, I'm surprised that you focus on venture uh, capital uh, because for me, uh, if we work on the CAPM model and changing it, because of course, just as you say, it's flawed and especially now we know better about cognitive biases and all. And so I'd rather focus on market finance. Uh, and, and I guess that if you take the venture capital model, actually, you already have some ecosystem strategies. Um, because you have some, some VCs that have a portfolio strategy, but if you take, for example, startup studios, um, you have some that have a real collaboration and ecosystem strategy in the way they launch their own companies. But then the, the different, the success rather relates to uh, good management and uh, a good investment thesis uh, and, and a good bet on the ecosystem. Um, but, but I mean, to, to prove your model, my feeling is that uh, the, the, key, the key thing is rather at uh, a listed company stock exchange level, no? So that's part of what needs to be worked on. I'd say I don't know of any ecosystems out there in the normal startup world. The, the minimum in my usage of the word ecosystem is that after every business cycle, every single business in the ecosystem shares its surplus with the other businesses in the ecosystem. So all businesses get dividends from each other. All businesses share in the capital gain of each other within the ecosystem. And what, what that amounts to is the the conditions for a viable ecosystem in nature is that you have common metabolic pathways, you have shared DNA, and what that then leads to is you have a level of inter-species co-governance. All of the species co-govern each other within the ecosystem. So even the, the normal startup you know, organizations that think of them themselves as ecosystems the level of collaboration and shared resources is not deeply anchored into how they're incorporated. It's more a very fragile, superficial agreement. And if, and, you know, if one of the companies, the investor behind the company decides to sell the company to the highest bidder, that company could be removed from the ecosystem at exactly the point where the rest of the ecosystem would really benefit from their growth. Okay. Elizabeth um, and Misha, welcome uh, to the call. Um, Paul, you had a question. I'd like to, in recognition that the time is marching on. Perhaps we could hear from Paul and then Steve and then John and then go into a perhaps a broader discussion around the points that the three of you bring in. 
So Paul first, and then Steve Cook, and then John. Can I jump in as well, Graham, at some point? Great, you come in after John, and then we'll have a discussion about the points that all four of you raise. Mm -hmm. And then also, Alan raised a really good um, issue a little earlier. Right, let's hear from Paul, Steve Cook, John, and Steve Podmore. So, Paul. That sounds like a 60s band, by the way. It does. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Graham and Jack, I really want- Nothing to... wrong with that. There's lot, no. lots, of good, lots of good bands in the 60s. Lots of good bands in the 60s. I really want to congratulate you on this amazing work I too have been on the road for 12 years and was so glad to have bumped into or manifested, whatever you like, Graham. So I've been working uh, with him and glad to be here today. I put some questions in the chat, which I won't repeat. However, I have a new question and it's based on the reality of proving the evidence. At one time, I was calling myself a corporate oncologist. I was saying to a leader, if you were the cancer in this business, do you want to know about it? And most of them said no, because they wouldn't pay for the intervention which would create the healing. And I have the same question around this. This is magic you're, you're after creating. And how, in the same paradox as Jack is, teaching the old, living the new, in what way, can this be offered so that it doesn't threaten the existing system and we get invitations in to run them in parallel? That's my question. Great. Thanks, Paul. Steve Cook. Yeah, I've got a, a kind of associate question. So to Otty's point, yeah, we've got to build these bridges between academia and, and the real world where, where, as Donna said, the boots are on the ground. I, I prefer to say that I work down in the sewers. Um, because that's, uh, that's, that's the real world for me. Um, so I didn't study economics, and I didn't study business, and I didn't study statistics, and I didn't study physics, but I have spent 35 years as a strategist working with businesses and governments and civil society organisations all over the world. And I uh, understand the principles of what you're saying. I think that's great. I've got some commentary around, around the way that um, current ecosystems operate in complex businesses like tech enterprises and things like that. That, um, because I think they've got a way of operating that comes part way to this and they've managed to create huge efficiencies off the back of building those partnerships and alliances and ecosystems. The question now from me though is, uh, Graham as you know, I, I'm working to enable businesses, governments and civil society organisations to now work in coalitions to solve systemic problems that we face in society. And uh, Donna knows this as well, we're building this out right now. When an ecosystem consists of common parts, i.e. they're all businesses, say, startups, that kind of thing, reminds me a little bit of the cooperative movements. Um, and so the cooperatives that I was involved in back in the early 90s, where there was commons, although we didn't call, call it that. But where you have stakeholders that need to be in an ecosystem to solve challenges, and those come from across different parts of society, they don't all have the same outcomes metrics, success metrics, understanding of economics or funding, or even the same requirements for economic financial returns on investments. Sometimes those returns exist elsewhere getting homeless people off the streets as an example. So whereas we know economics plays a huge part in that, but the actual outcome requirements is going to be different across each of those essential stakeholders. Does this model work in that context? Can it be shaped to work in that context? Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, John. Um, I didn't actually have my hand up, but I'm not going to not going to turn away an opportunity to get my stick my oar in. Um, I was actually congratulating Donna on her um, comment about um, you know ne needing to work out how to do the boots on the ground part. Um, but I will I will sort of say that, that it seems to me from what Stephen was just saying um, and possibly what Paul was saying is that I think it's folk the, the, the fair shares commons as I understand have six six different capitals 
and what we're focusing on at the moment is just one of them, which is the financial one. Um, what I think you're talking about, Stephen, is more human and, and uh, social capital, and, yeah. and those are the well, those are the two that I focus on. And the disconnect well. between understandings of those things. Yeah, and my feeling is, I mean, I, th this is my work on that front is basically trying to make that as those as sexy as the financial one. At the moment, the financial one really is the sexy one. So it's how do we make the social and the human capital as much as catnip as the financial one is at the yeah. moment and that's the question uh, yeah. i'm working on it <laughs> and there's, a slow, <laughs> there's a slow migration to that but it, but it's too yeah. slow so we need to kind of force that somehow i think i'm not sure force i'm, I'm going more the attraction route but yeah I, it's mm -hmm. the same principle just making it sort of uh, um yeah irresistible irresistibly irresistible. Lovely, social was social and human capital yeah so that's it thank you thank you um, well said john thank you for that steve podmore yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Graham. Uh, nice to see you. And it's um, interesting to see how these ideas have come forward. Um, so um, as some people know I'm working on an idea to create, um, we call it a sustainable innovation and development bank. And what you're talking about is, um, I would say it's kind of uh, the wisdom of intelligent groups um, in a portfolio theory with, um, uh, with, with the addition of, of the sort of game theory type math that you're talking about. I just want to bring onto the screen just the, the picture, uh, hopefully you can see it, of, of what we're looking at in terms of a portfolio structure. So essentially it's a volume of early stage investments that progress through stages to a small number of later stage investments. And the whole approach is designed to be an ecosystem uh, where those volumes of uh, small 1 million deals of which half, a, half of the million is essentially cash and half is added value, help and support is designed to progress through multiple stages. And it means that you can have an active ecosystem. Um, I'll just take it off screen. And um, that's essentially part of the, the model to de deliver this bank. Um, I won't bore you with how the, the funds are raised and, and um, other aspects, the sort of liquid por portion of the fund and the direct portion, what I've just explained, I call the butterfly basket portfolio structure. And that is uh, the direct portion of, of the fund. Um, so uh, what you're talking about, I think, is really interesting. If you add the incentive, I, I'm not sure the concept of um, uh, um, all, all uh, uh, fair share commons, I don't think it needs to be that. Uh, and I think it's very difficult to get everyone to change their structure. I think B Corps are an interesting structure that kind of do an awful lot of what you're talking about, but in a way that has more flexibility. But I think the neat bit that you're identifying is the fact that if you take a little bit of the equity or the upside and you put that into a common pool, um, what that has the ability to do is to uh, incentivize everyone to collaborate, even though it's collaboration uh, um, in a, a total sense. Sometimes the, you have to have the right level of diversity. Of course, the early stage entities might uh, fail, but if they're working if they're failing for the right reasons and people are showing the right attitude, they can work with por the portfolio that are, that are working. So uh, the, the, the point I wanted to make is this is a progressive thing. It's not a moment in time. And I think that's part of what you identified uh, with your approach. And that is, it's a progressive sort of structure um, so that the ecosystem sort of benefits can, can increase uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. And in the structure that we're talking about, you make uh, money for the on the fund level at the right hand side, uh, you know, where you're essentially investing from 12 to 360 million, you do the discovery at the left hand side, the one and the 4 million. But actually, it's really about the impacts. It's all about uh, delivering significant social environmental impact um, uh, aligned with the SDGs. So I really like the approach. And I'd like to uh, thank Donna and Steve for, for encouraging me to join uh, the call and learn a bit more. So um, yeah, that's me. I'm done for the moment. Thanks, Steve. I see quite a few other people have hands up. I would suggest I'll, I'll stay quiet for a bit and let's just have more conversation across everybody in here, both in response to what's just been said or anything new you want to bring in. And perhaps to, to manage the, the flow, please put your hand up and then I'll choreograph you in. Um, I see Robert Delner has his hand up. So, Robert. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is uh, excellent stuff. Um, I just want to sort of take down a slightly different road, uh, only in the sense that 
where I'm coming from, as you know, Graham, I come from a credit background. And what you've discussed here has obviously a lot of similarities to it. So in, in credit, um, you look at probabilities of default, right? Which is a function of probability of default or loss given default as a function of probability of default times the par value minus the recovery rate, right? LGD. That's kind of the statistical equation that we use, uh, same as with the insurance industry. Uh, what happens in statistics in the credit space is that a AAA may have sort of a quarter of a percent chance in any given year to default and say a single B has three or four, five percent, for argument's sake. But we know that the statistics is fundamentally wrong because of course, if they do default, that small percentage goes to 100 in a nanosecond. So essentially, we all know in credit that there's something fundamentally wrong with statistics. And as you know, it's lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? <laughs> so the, the, the challenge here is to try and sort of keep the statistical um, examples clean. I, I would maybe challenge the person who said that all company failures or successes is in relation to luck uh, only because um, I would argue that it's very much in relation to funding or access to funding capacity to access finance. And you see that again in credit uh, over time. Yes, most companies default over a very long series of times, etc. but it's the one that has access to capital. If you then compare that to your ecosystem by including the 1%, I'm wondering if you're actually including a finance function, essentially, that you give each company access to funding at 1%, but essentially there is no paying back or there is no uh, cost of capital in that sense. So I'm wondering whether you, you're comparing apples and oranges in, in that sense. Because within business, as you know, one of the fundamental reasons why business kind of suggests they should exist is because they have a capacity to remove the companies out of the system which do not deserve funding, which will fail because of a, whether it's management, the business cycle, the product, et cetera. There's a, there's a failure within that organization so it's kind of a Darwinian way of removing them from the ecosystem, allowing someone else to come in who can do it better with a better product, et cetera. And the ones that can, they get funding from the ecosystem. So it's a life enhancing self-funded system in that respect. So I'm just sort of asking the question to you whether you have sort of considered the, the, the appropriateness of uh, relating portfolio one to the ecosystem in, in that respect. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, let me just pick up briefly on what Robert said. So this is an extremely simple model that just has pure statistics in it. Um, what I suspect from the little I know of credit and risk is that if you dive into it, you'll find that similar to in economics, the statistics that are being used assumes everything is ergodic, sees this kind of downward behavior up here, and then introduces correction factors to get the mathematics to give the same answers that you see in reality. And this, for example, in economics, eliminates many of the reasons for putting utility functions into economics. Utility functions emerge as a fudge factor to patch after the fact, the use of an incorrect statistical approach. Um, so it would be superb if somebody who really understands credit could dive into this and really tease, tease things apart. In terms of access to capital and Paul Ormerod's work, this 
might well be equivalent to access to a credit facility. And I suspect that if we were chatting to Paul Ormerod, his book, by the way, is well worth reading. There, there are a lot of nuances in this as well. Um, and clearly there's, there's more than just good or bad luck involved. I think the more accurate conclusion from his work is that he, the final trigger for a business failing was only describable by random probability. That's not to say that there weren't other factors involved as well, but the catalyst for the final failure was randomness. Chris. Hiya. So uh, just a couple of things. Thank you for your inputs. Um, uh, uh, Graham, especially, it's very good to see you after a long time. Um, so my lens on this, uh, a practitioner, consultant around sustainable success for the last 25 years, looking at organizations. Um, and the, the systems model that I tend to default to is the uh, cybernetic thinking, and partly because that takes the uh, natural world and tries to apply it to organizational thinking. And I guess part of what I'm reflecting in this conversation is how we make sure we look broadly enough in this um, outside of the, the kind of the, the, the limits of the financial part um, and also how we get to the right level of recursion because what I learned from cybernetics is that effectively the people who will make the choices and the decisions are those that are nearest to the issue or the system or the problem that you're looking at so um, and it's not something that can be done from a kind of high level to them so I think through this lens and the modelling part of that lens would also make me realise that, um, you know, most of the economic thinking is just an att attempt to uh, map and describe the world as it operates, but they're all imperfect. And I think that's part of what we're grappling with, that, you know, all economic descriptions are imperfect. And what we really need to, to, to look at is how we can connect stuff as much as possible with the, the kind of reality of the world that we're living in. Yes. Very, very true. Uh, and as a... I don't know where that takes you, but you asked for sharing of perceptions, and that's what was my head was busy with when you were talking. So. I would say it takes us to a very good place because the, what's happening down here in this ecosystem model is how the natural world works. There's a high level of resource sharing across and collaboration across elements in a natural ecosystem. And what this is showing is that even a small level of collaboration fundamentally changes the nature of the game in a pure statistical game. And that is, for me, highly compelling evidence of what many people have known and said for thousands of years that humanity succeeds, life succeeds because of collaboration, not pure competition. And this is a, an indication that the, many of the statements in economics and business that of perfect efficiency of the marketplace, perfect competition, et cetera, et cetera, is coming out of a fundamentally flawed use of statistics. So Graham, I'm just coming in quickly. I, I, I do think that the graph on the ecosystem is correct. I mean, I do, I do think that the, the resilience and if you, if you look at all the capitals which become interdependent within an ecosystem. So for example, if you take the, um, the Japanese form of conglomerates, for example, why they are so resilient, et cetera. Lots of uh, showcases which, which shows that I think th that is the right way. I'm just sort of uh, questioning, I guess, the, um, the self-funded argument as the driver. Uh, I think you could, you, you'll find that th there, are, there are significant other drivers which, which actually could make that even look better in, in a way. Um, because there's no doubt that the ecosystem approach is, is, is more 
um, you know, capitalizes everyone equally in a, in a, in a much better way. Absolutely. No, you, you're spot on with that, Robert. Yeah, this is a really simple um, simulation that only has a coin being tossed every cycle for heads or tails and a pure growth rate in some variable. It doesn't have anything else. And as even in that really, really simple system, you see a fundamental transformation between the two setups. And as soon as you have something that is, say, a multi-capitals incorporation, where all of the capitals have a governance role, and through that governance role, it means that all of the capitals can trust each other and trust each other over long periods of time, that underpins the kind of collaboration. Yeah, that's where things like the B Corp have a fragility. They're not inherently multi-capital. And in many instances, implementations of B Corp, it's still really difficult to create that kind of systemic protection of collaboration of dividend sharing, et cetera, across the whole ecosystem over a 10, 20, 50, 100 year horizon. So to get this really anti-fragile does require to go at it in a different way to almost anything that we have currently available on the incorporation axis. Well, and, and Grab, you have to attack the status quo, which is that the capital is held by a very limited number of people. So it's in their interest to protect the current system. So, you know, it, we don't end up with what we've got by accident. <laughs> um, it's, you know, people uh, use their capital and resources to underwrite the, the chance game that you're describing. So they will benefit. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would recommend, if I could just say something, I would recommend uh, there's someone called Astrid Schultz, and um, she is uh, involved in something called Zebras Unite. So the, the basic concept is rather than unicorns, these fictional mythical creatures, um, zebras is uh, more of a, a, a term about uh, entities that want to create um, the kind of business relationships that are about patient capital, about um, uh, in a different way to B Corps is really about entities that can work collaboratively and, and, and address our systemic uh, challenges. She's also part of a group who wrote a, a paper called Billions to Trillions. And um, I, I would reach out to her because I think she would really like the approach. Um, I, I still have the, the challenge. You, you've got to get people to sign up to this and say, you know, we're really going in and we're trusting the, the math, you know, and our equity and our dividends to this collective. And, and as Steve said, you know, there is, you know, something about the cooperative movement, but, but equally the cooperative movement has had its challenges um, uh, over the years. You know, ultimately we need to move capital at very significant scale to, uh, to tackle, you know, the world's greatest challenges. And I think you have a time challenge ultimately to get buy-in, you know, you really need to get some critical mass. And uh, I, I struggle to believe that even though I accept that the B Corp movement has its limitations. I'm asking, do you really need people to say we're, we're throwing everything into the pot? Or could it work just with a, a slice of, of equity or dividend you know, into the collective? Because then it, it's far more likely to integrate with you know, progressive forms of impact investment rather than, you know, you know it, it, I just really struggle to, 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 to see it um, being adopted with, with the approach that you're talking about. So for clarity, the fair shares commons only requires a slice. It's not everything. Um, so, and if you look at this simulation, recall it was only 1% of the win that goes into the pot, which is then shared equally to all companies, including the companies that put into the pot in the first place. So it's only around half a percent is enough to fundamentally transform the game. Now, so what, what, so I just didn't get the bit, what would be the problem with B Corps or, or uh, you know, other mission aligned entities then? I, I didn't, you know, because 
I'm struggling to see why that would be a, a, an issue. That's quite a big question. And I perhaps we don't have quite the time for that. I'll, I'll stay on longer and I can dive into that in more detail after the, the formal half past closing point. But I know, I think Donna, do you have a point to bring in? Um, maybe, uh, maybe. Um, I do believe that the B Corps are currently still fragile. They're better than not B Corp. Um, but again, depending on whether they're private or public and depending on where their funding comes from and depending on how they perform and how they get their funding and this push for short term um, uh, gain that, that doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't allow um, for the full spectrum of, of um, healthy, vibrant uh, growth and performance. Um, I don't fully understand, you know, I, don't, I probably don't have all the, the pieces of that puzzle, but I do know that the B Corps take you part of the way there. But if we look at what's going on in the world, even with B Corps, there's about 3,700 B Corp certified companies in the world. Uh, that's not very many when you look at the grand scheme of things. And when we think about the need to gain more traction and to get some kind of transformative change um, and impact uh, against those SDGs, I would say we need something more. And we are, you know, I'm working with a company that's on the B Corp path early gain, you know, early on, but it is not, um, it's not an easy path all in of itself. So if um, at any point along the, the line, there's a need for some kind of funding, additional funding um and i'll stop there because i'll probably be way outside my my great thanks donna let's pick up paul and then elizabeth and i recognize that we're getting close to half past so at half past <clears throat> i will say a couple of things and then we continue for whoever wants to stay on longer paul Thank you all. I want to borrow from George Bernard Shaw, who reminds us that all truth begins with a blasphemy. So I'm really excited to be engaged with a, at least some blasphemers. And it's a very practical question. What can I do to help? You had me at hello. What do you want me to do? I'll do it. That's an excellent question. Um, there are a number of things to do, but one of the big ones is I see a critical next step for this blasphemy to become a truth <laughs> that number one, the message reaches as many people as possible. So that's one simple activity. Yeah. And that, that can include simple things like by the way, Jack and I have just added a couple more bits to this book. So we're going to have an upgraded release 1.1 hitting the, the printing room tonight. Um, so reviews on um, amazon.com on any bookseller, things like that of this book. Perhaps the next stage up is we're currently slowly growing participation in our startup creation and acceleration program. So we're actively looking for founders and startups that are able to self-fund their participation in these programs at the moment to join in the programs to create a big enough ecosystem of companies that we really start to have hard track evidence of traction and then the third thing that we're actively working on is identifying innovative investors who will recognize what's behind here and who have the kind of personality profile where they say, all truth begins with a blasphemy. I want to be the first involved in this. I'll invest precisely because it's new, innovative, and nobody else has got behind it yet. 
So I would say those are the three areas where we're looking for help. Um, let me jump to Elizabeth and then to Daniel. Thanks again, Graham, and thanks, Jack. Um, really appreciate the discussion and also just the work to get to this place. Um, just a practical question, and, and I'll just echo what others have said. I actually have a couple of B Corps um, in my portfolio, and, and I think that they still are not uh, going to solve at the ecosystem level. You might do a little better inside the entity itself, and so that's good. Um, gives, you know, really, you know, I think only one scenario where it really changes the game. And that's if there is a buyer of the company, um, the board can make decisions for something other than, you know, than, a, you know, a minority shareholder. It won't ever solve a majority shareholder. I don't know if anybody really thinks about that. So in other words, you know, whoever tips the scales and has 50.1% of the votes is going to be able to control the destiny of that B Corp no matter what. It really just allows the board to make an alternative action when there's a minority player in the game that wants to take you know, a, a transaction. So um, just something to note that I think is important, better than, you know, than not having that ability. Um, that said, I'm really thinking practically, Graham, and, and maybe this is for others as well, which is, okay, imagine that we have a portfolio and I have the ability to do this. I have a number of companies that could put a shared um, uh, pool, if you will, together. I wonder at what point, it seems like there would be a minimum N to get to ecosystem. You know, three probably doesn't do it. I don't know if 30 does it. I'm just a very curious question about the N. Um, how many need to be in, and then like how the practicality of how this would functionally work. You know, there's ownership in, you know, sort of all, and, you know, if they're, depending on what stage of company they are, you know, even an early stage company that starts this, you know, there's a seven to 10 year horizon before there's liquidity, right? Typically, not always, but typically. So I'm just sort of thinking about like functionally how this might work. Um, you know, if one were to, you know, put it in a, in a sales pitch to, hey, let's, let's get collective, right, to a series of portfolio companies, how would that really manifest in a, in a practical way? And I'll pause there. Great. Um, so I, I recognize it's at half past. So for people who scheduled 90 minutes for this, let me say at this point, before I come to what you've just said, Elizabeth, thank you very much to everybody for joining in this call. And we look forward to seeing you all in a month's time. We'll be scheduling another one on the 27th of March. Sorry, April. We're already in March. So 27th of April, we'll be scheduling another one. The time still to be determined. We would like to schedule at a time where it's easier for Californian end folk to attend. And if anybody wants to follow up on any further details, you know, take a look at our website for the training programs, follow Jack and myself on LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. And reach out if there is anything we can do. So thank you very much to everybody. Jack, any last words from you? And then I'll come to Elizabeth's question. Um, I, I just probably wish I didn't have to leave early, but I do have to leave and I have to go teach. But I will be teaching the good stuff and I'll be educating my students very, very well. Um, I really appreciate all these remarks. I mean, I'm just, uh, just amazed at the, the erudition and the uh, insightfulness of, of everything that was asked and written. And it's just a real pleasure to participate in this. Um, I would just also just like to mention that we don't just, him and I, we don't possess all the answers. This is, this is something that we're working on. And I, I do think we basically need a revolution. We need a revolution in economics and business thinking and any revolution it's, it's, we need more people. And I would just like to end it there. And I wish everybody a good day. Jack, can I invite you to think of a revolution? Be careful about your spell that you're creating. 
I really like that, Paul. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wrote that down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, uh, I don't even know if that's the right word, but, um, you know, just, 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 a, or the word I like to use is uh, reconceptualization. You know, that's the word I use in my own writing. Right. Which I do think works. So pick, picking up on Elizabeth's question, and I'll come to you, Daniel, in terms of the number of companies the, the actual formula that describes the change between this graph here, pure competition, and this graph here with some level of collaboration, it's the square root of the number of companies in the ecosystem and the amount of sharing that drives the shift of this red median line from downward sloping closer and closer to the dotted black line going up here. So already from nine companies, you would have a factor of three improvement in the shift of that median company upwards. If you were to share, so if you had three companies, sorry, if you had nine companies, and you were sharing, I invent a number, maybe 5% of the surplus, perhaps it would need to be 10%, you would already get a shift of that median from downward sloping to upward sloping. And I can run that simulation afterwards in our toy model simulator and see where it gets to. Now, of course, what that simulation lacks is all of the other things that play a role in business. So there's a lot more, you know, really what we need is a full on research team to dive into this and look at all of the different aspects of it, including the things around um, debt that Robert was pointing at, et cetera. But the, the positive message is you begin having a benefit already from a relatively small ecosystem and the bigger the ecosystem, the bigger the benefit. If you look at a company like, for example, Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble has 22 brands, each worth a billion dollars plus, and a whole host of smaller brands that are worth less than a billion dollars. In many senses, Procter & Gamble functions like this. If one brand gets lucky, that brand, because it's all within one Procter & Gamble, shares some of its winnings with the other brands. So this gives a completely new way of looking at the big multinationals that have multiple brands across a wide diversity. As was mentioned earlier, a new way of looking at why the Japanese Korean type of conglomerate is so resilient, let alone maybe anti-fragile, they actually function as if they were a, an ecosystem of collaborating smaller companies. And so if we incorporate startups in such a way that they can truly share winnings and losses with each other, what we're doing in many ways is creating something that is big and small at the same time. It has the size of say a Japanese conglomerate or a Procter and Gamble and the speed and agility of small startups. And for me, that is an absolutely winning combination in, in how to do it. Um, the other thing I'd throw into your question, Elizabeth, of how does it functionally work? And this links a bit to your question of the B Corp, Steve. A key thing for this approach to work is a deep level of trust and trust across time. You need to really know that when a company gets phenomenally successful, that nobody has the power to simply sell it, that there is no majority stakeholder that has so much governance power that they can simply exit and extract all of the wealth from the ecosystem. The, 
each company needs to be governed in such a way that it really is all for one, one for all, without any possibility of that being damaged. Um, and that's why for it to work, I, I think that if, if this is done in any way that has a strong dependence on values alignment, ethical alignment, goodwill, etc., it is going to fall apart as soon as there is more wealth in the system, more success in the system, wealth, whatever units you're measuring it in, than the ethical values can handle. Now, I know Daniel has a hand up, so let's pick up on what Daniel has to say, and then let's go back to Paul and then Donna. Thank you, Graham. Um, thanks for a lovely discussion, everyone. Um, I was wondering with the grassroots starting ecosystems, if you have come across or, or studied any of the emerging um, blockchain-based uh, ecosystems that are one I saw uh, as part of the Gaia net, which I also see Evolute 6 as part of is Seeds, which is, which is a very elaborate, um, yeah, a very elaborate ecosystem, including both uh, uh, tokens, non, non like speculative tokens, but also uh, a constitution for incorporating both as citizens and as uh, as companies and and so on. Uh, this seems to to take this into if if you want to be part of one thing, you want you you are part of it all, and then whatever you create of value is automatically also shared with others you don't really have a say in it yes so perfect question um if you look on my website in the article so the graham hyphen boy dot biz there's a an interview that i did with one of the thought leaders in the blockchain space about 18 months ago on the link between the fair shares commons level five incorporation, the blockchain and decentralized autonomous organizations. And the way I look at it is in essence, what we've done with the fair shares commons incorporation is created something that has much of the essence of a decentralized autonomous organization running on the blockchain with smart contracts but in a way that hacks existing corporate structures to create something that does the same kind of thing in a way that you can incorporate as a company in a certain jurisdiction. So for example, for a DAO that actually wants to be legally recognized and trade, the Fair Shares Commons is a superb legal concretization of the same essence that led to the DAO and vice versa, within our startup ecosystem, we have somebody who's already ported the Fair Shares Comms Incorporation onto the blockchain so that you can run, first of all, as a virtual Fair Shares Commons company on the blockchain, and you only incorporate it when you need to. Then in terms of seeds, and I would strongly recommend everybody to join seeds. So, we're in direct conversation with Seeds and we're exploring how could the different elements of Seeds be, be integrated with what we're doing and how can what we're doing integrate with Seeds. We also have been looking closely at HIFA, which is the organization that works with Seeds and they're structured as a decentralized holographic organization, a DHO rather than a DAO. So there's a lot of synergy there. We're also talking directly to Doug Horn, who founded the Telos blockchain that Seeds is running on, and Suvi, who runs the Telos Foundation. 
because the fair shares commons and the kind of ecosystems we're looking at, that's an all capitals, all stakeholders ecosystem. And to have that kind of ecosystem really function, we need currencies native to each of the capitals we're touching. So we need to have time currencies, intellectual capital currencies, um, relationship capital currencies, along with all of the others, so that all of this wealth sharing is happening across all kinds of currencies in their native currency without needing to be forced through an exchange rate into money and then back out of money. Because you get so many inefficiencies and losses when you try to measure everything in money and force it through that. So that's a part of what we are working on with a couple of volunteers and where one of the things we're looking for are a volunteers who want to get even more involved with that and b this is part of what we are going to use the investment that we are currently raising to actually fund the development of an ecosystem level platform a, a, an ecosystem substrate to support these kind of outcomes across all capitals at maximum efficiency, minimum wastage by doing it in native currencies rather than trying to force everything through money and then out again. Does that cover your question, Daniel? Great, thank you. And Paul. Um, thanks, guys. I've just put it in the text there. I, I volunteer our entire system. <laughs> you can play with it. You can play with the Celt. Um, you spoke about your modeling system. Do you have any macros for human stupidity, greed, envy, sex, or power? They're the things that we're finding driving shadow behavior so um what are your shadow macros i really like that question it your starting point a macro for human stupidity brought to mind one of my favorite quotes from albert einstein who said at one point apparently that as far as he knew there were only two things in the two things that were infinite the universe and human stupidity. He just wasn't completely sure about the universe. <laughs> so, you know, to that point, there are all of these shadow sides that come in. And sometimes these shadow sides mean that it it may, for example, be appropriate for a certain company to collapse and to be shut down because of this shadow side. That's why in our approach to company and corporation, it's vitally important that the company itself is autopoetic, that the company itself has internally the power to shut itself down, to die, to, to, for the cell to declare auto, um, what's it called? autopoptosis, something like that, when a cell kills itself. Autopoiesis, yeah. Um, autopoiesis is the quality of life. There's another word that I can't quite find that describes what happens inside a cell when it kills itself. And this is one of the weaknesses of the B Corp. The B Corp is still dependent on the decisions of the majority shareholder. It's not yet able to decide for itself that it's time to die independent of what any of the shareholders say. And for an ecosystem to really thrive, as Chris Heald said, we, we need to really include in it many of the elements, at least many, if not all of the central elements of how ecosystems work. And one of the key things of ecosystems is that the ecosystem as a whole recognizes when it's time for something to die or something new to emerge and it has the power to do that it's not the prisoner or the the slave of a certain um force 
Paul, I assume you're still in there and that you can hear me. Goody good. Because what I'm about to say. Getting a Mandarin, that's all. Grand. All of the shadow side stuff. By misinterpreting this world as if it was the predicted world of that dotted line up there, that actually is an open invitation with almost no source of protection to the shadow side behavior being seen as normal and the appropriate strategy. The more, the more that the world we live in is dominated by unpredictable events, in other words, good or bad luck, the, and the less we recognize that that is what's happening and that the way to reduce the variability is through collaboration, the more it looks that betting on the unicorn and exiting early is the right rational strategy. Surely you have to believe in unicorns. Indeed, and I suspect that there are a lot of people out there who believe in unicorns. Donna, you seem yeah. to be waving fingers at me. Yeah, their fingers on. Yeah, uh, partly it's trying to check my understanding and weave some threads together. So, um, <laughs> and we've bumped into some paradox here. I think this, there's sort of an underlying question that says, um, what's the fragility in this anti-fragile model? <laughs> um, because there is always some shadow and light, but I think you're mitigating against some of that shadow, which makes a lot of sense. I do understand what you're saying about the fragility of B Corp um, organizations, because they aren't together in a coalition of other organizations in an ecosystem, which would make them more robust. And so they're, they're isolated and they're having to fend for themselves and do their best and really are trying to be a force for good in the world, but they're up against all of the forces of the big world. So I'm getting all of that, but I wanna get back to an earlier comment that I think Steve Podmore made um, way back, which uh, was disentangling the, the funding, the potential around what you can do with funding from the big ball of wax with Fair Shares Commons. So again, it's back to a very practical question because even if in the ideal world, we could move more towards the Fair Shares Commons quickly because there's a real need for something more akin to that. If there's some incremental steps Nobody that knows. can start to get us there where we can test some things that are, that are simpler, um, th that's where I know the two Steves and I, where we can, you know, potentially go with this or certainly would want to pursue it. And, uh, let me check with the two of them to see whether I'm making any sense at all. <laughs> we don't know where the other one is. Oh, he's there. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, there's an awful lot of great things in here. I mean, um, I, I, I need to understand more, frankly, but, um, and there's some of the suppositions around um, the exits. I mean, what we're building in, one of the big challenges is that exits are often taken way too early to satisfy, you know, uh, um, short-term interests. But, but equally, it's good to take ex exits at certain times to top up the portfolio and where the follow-on markets can actually uh, really drive uh, uh, intelligent growth and, and ultimately impacts. So the question is, but what does that look like as a broad portfolio and a broad ecosystem? And the key is really getting the governance right. You know, B Corps, I agree entirely that the limitations, and I'm not, you know, only into B Corps, not at all. But I think what's good about them is it's a culture and a thought process. You can actually change a B Corp through voting structures that have, for example, as we're trying to do, there's a foundation that we're setting up and over time control will, will, will move entirely to that foundation that will have people representing nature, uh, people representing future generations. It will include investors and it will include the management myself, but it will also include the impact entrepreneurs we're setting up to see. 
or to, to, to address. So ultimately, yeah, I, I don't buy the basic proposition that, that um, these things cannot be controlled. They can be, you know, but when you look at Zuckerberg and, and Facebook, it's controlled in the wrong direction. It's kind of a dictatorship. You need sometimes good leadership in the short term, but you need that effective governance in the long term. And that transition is tricky, I think, to get right, but it's absolutely essential. So when you look at the sort of decision framework of existing short term models like venture capital, uh, it, they're entirely flawed. But, you know, but there are some good elements. Um, when you change and, and add remediation and organized help and support that's incentivized, when you add, like you say, a slice of common, uh, common equity or common dividend, you know, and when you drive collaboration through technology, through uh, smart decision making process, through what we call augmented intelligence uh, decision making engine, based on the wisdom of crowds, but I call it the wisdom of uh, intelligent groups. When you add these things and stack these layers, you can drive overall performance and impacts. But equally, you you have to be able to tolerate and embrace failure early on. And I, I agree with what you're saying, Graham, that that um, uh, uh, you know things should naturally die, um, or they should be killed off in the investment cycle if they're proving that they're going to have they're part carbon positive rather than carbon negative, for example, it's the right reason for an entity to, to, to die or be killed off, you know, because ultimately we don't want to be funding things where the, the path is only negative. We want to show a path that can move from uh, uh, negative or positive to, uh, or neutral to, to, to extremely positive over time. So ultimately I, I really believe in the, the concept of things must be, allowed to, to die. I mean, Schumpeter called it creative destruction in a different form. So what Don is saying, I think, is uh, 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 absolutely there's things that I really like. I like the stats. Basically, your stats prove my theory. And if you really take a look at this, the structure for the fund, it's designed to be a, a 9 billion sterling fund that will do direct market-based investing as well as the what we call the butterfly basket portfolio structure, and I've been designing in these processes for years. But with your 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 stats, you show basically that collabor collaboration counts, and um, if you can incentivize appropriately, it counts more. Um, so you know I, I don't want to go on and on and on, but um, uh, what I'm saying, Graham, uh, and and uh, you know the others is I'm interested in. You know, although I'm very time short with the raise of the 30 million to kick Transform Global off and to help Steve and, and Steve is uh, hopefully going to be part of what we're doing and Donna, um, what we're what the objective is, is to get the capital in that enables us to build the system. And I'm interested to have dialogue. This is your perfect test bed. So, you know, ultimately, uh, we're not going to incorporate every element because I actually don't think it's necessary. And I think it could be. Yeah, you know, it could make things more difficult to raise the capital that the, the, the scale of capital that we're raising, but absolutely the the base theories I, I buy into. So that's me. So a few thoughts picking up on that. Um, where am I? And I might need to run because I have a Zoom call with another Stephen Vasconellas, and I'll say hello. Right. But go ahead. Say hi to Steve from me as well. Before, before, before you, you do, I've got to go in about 10 minutes because I've got a clubhouse room at 5.30 entitled System Innovation and Finance right. to Fund the Global Goals. So I, I, I literally got 10 minutes and I've got to go and prep for that. But um, very, this has been great. Very briefly, this is why I'm so excited about having undercovered the statistical flaw in how most people think around investing in business is that it underpins what everybody in this call has known intuitively is about how the world works. Interestingly, if I pose that initial bet question to people who have not had any statistical training, they almost invariably say, no, I will not take the bet because they intuitively know that life works differently to the way we get taught in statistics classes. Second quick point is, our fair shares commons is not the only way of achieving level five incorporation. Or let me maybe say more accurately, level five structures and processes connecting different stakeholders with each other. There are many different ways of doing level five. What I am clear on is that if you're at level three or below, it's fragile. 
extremely fragile, too dependent on the goodwill of the people involved. And almost all B Corps that I've seen are at level three. That's, that's the issue that I see there. Now, all of these are good viable places to be. I'm not saying that there is only one right way to do it and everything else is wrong. It's everything brings with it some benefits and some disadvantages. And what's important is to recognize that the way that you structure the relationship between stakeholders is just a tool to do the job. Get clear on what is the job you need to do and then design the most appropriate tool to do the job recognizing that it may need to evolve over time, which comes back, Steve Cook, to what you were saying. If you're dealing with the kind of ecosystem that you're dealing with, it's going, you're probably going to need a fair bit at level five, but you may also need some things that are at level one or level two or even level zero within that whole structure. So again, it's about, as Chris Heald said, looking at it from the nature's perspective, what is it that you need for the entirety to function the way you need it to function to do the job you're trying to do? And then how do you build the tool to do that job? So, so in answer to that, um, Graham, as, as, as we probably discussed before, I think there are two, th certainly in, in my universe, there are two things going on here. That there is the type of ecosystem that we build for ourselves as an institution. That, that's great. And Steve, Podmore and everybody have been talking about that. I'm already looking at a sort of organisational model for that that is getting more complex by the minute. So I want to, to do something about that. Um, but the other part is the more kind of exciting part, which is that the ecosystems that we will be building, the coalitions, as I call them, we can debate that, that word, but the, the ecosystems that we are building and that we will carry on building all over the world to, to um, relate to different types of scenarios, social issues, challenges that people face, they will be, I would suggest, infinitely variable. There will be a, a, an entirely, so if we're looking at, and, and it's one that uh, you know about and I've mentioned before, when we're looking at how to resolve sex trafficking in a US city, that is fundamentally different to how to bring together different districts to create an integrated community in another city. And so that, so that mix, and that's kind of my earlier question really, was that the challenge that we believe we've resolved is how do you bring together those very disparate types of stakeholders that are not only made up across all five of your, certainly the, the, the bottom three of your um, types of organization there, but they include many other types of organization. So a local council is, is made up of an entire, in, in my view, anyway, certainly from what I've observed, uh, an entirely different type of structure with different types of vested interest priorities, confirmation biases and everything else that exists. So the thing gets complex. So, so I think the fair shares commons approach for us is brilliant but it would need to be built out in different ways in every type of scenario we went into exactly it's one of the things that i stress in our fair shares commons training and workshop the fair shares commons is about the essence the spirit of the fair shares commons and it can be materialized, concretized in multiple different ways that may look very different to each other at the surface, but the underlying essence is the same. And the underlying essence comes back to your question earlier about a corporate oncologist. It reminded me of two decades ago now, probably Anglo-American in their South African mines when AIDS was really taking off as a problem in South Africa, especially around the mining industry, Anglo-American offered free AIDS testing to everybody. And they discovered that almost nobody took, in, took advantage of the AIDS testing, even though you know, the executive team walked the talk and had their AIDS test and publicized their results and everything. And they discovered that the reason why nobody was taking the tests as you said, nobody wants to know they have AIDS if they can't afford the cure. They'd rather not know. So Anglo-American realized, oh, we'd better not just give free AIDS tests, 
but offer to anybody who's AIDS positive free retroviral treatment for the rest of their life. So they, they thought this was brilliant, that it would really work. They rolled it out and nobody took advantage of it. It barely moved the needle. What they then realized was that it wasn't going to help to just deal with the fact with the mine staff. They actually need to offer free testing and free treatment to every single member of the entire ecosystem that was in contact with the mine, including all of the sex workers around the mine. And only once they had done that, were they actually able to start moving the needle. And I was at a talk from the then CEO of Anglo-American who said, it was fundamentally a gamble against time that they would, that the price drop from generic retrovirals would come in faster than they were hemorrhaging money from their company coffers. And that if that gamble had just been a little bit off in time, they would have ended up going bankrupt with that strategy. As it was, the strategy worked superbly well and was really beneficial to all of South Africa. <clears throat> And the essence of the fair shares commons is that what matters in governance is who has the right to engage in governance. And the fair shares commons basically says everybody who is affected by a governance decision has to have the right to engage in governance and, a, and that the power balance across all of the stakeholders ensures that wise decisions are taken not the decision that is in the interest of a majority stakeholder. And the biggest governance question is around who has what share of the wealth generated. And so the key thing in the fair shares commons as well is that wealth is equitably shared across all of the stakeholders in some kind of relationship to their contribution to generate the wealth. And they can trust that this will happen long-term because they have an equitable governance power. And so long as you have that, and you build in key elements of a highly functional commons, you will have the essence of a fair shares commons, no matter what it actually looks like in a specific concretization. I guess the, the, the follow-up thing for me then, and I don't want to hog the conversation, but at the same time that you were dealing with all of that, with, with Anglo-American and so on, I was also launching ranges of virology drugs on, on behalf of uh, um, wow. Pfizer and Boehring and Wiggleheim and people like that. And there was an enormous issue in some of the work I was doing in South Africa centred around tribal leadership preventing people in villages from engaging in preventive measures to, to, to stop the spread of HIV and AIDS. And in a way, that's a different source of fair share commons, as far as I can see, because that's one where the wealth distribution is not the driver. It's, it's centred on a different thing, deep-rooted historical um governance structures if you want to call it that within within tribes so it it, beca it becomes really complicated when you think about fair shares commons within the context of parts of the ecosystem that don't have and i keep reversing back to the word money steve podmore knows this i'm, I'm not an investor i don't understand the language i'm just going to keep talking about money uh, you know where, where money is not the driving concern but where those people still need to be in, and are integral to the ecosystem Yes. Yeah. Again, you're absolutely spot on. And this is one of the central themes of the book Rebuild, which is it's inadequate. Yay. Yay. To just do something along the incorporation axis. It's inadequate to just do holacracy along the roles and tasks adequate axis. It's inadequate to just work on a culture of psychological safety. You actually need to work on all three axes simultaneously because they're so interdependent. You, know, you only have psychological safety if you are at least level two or level three in corporation. Um, if you don't have psychological safety, you can't do holacracy properly. You know, and all, all of these things are so interwoven. And to what you're saying, this human axis is 
highly dependent on the collective culture of the people who are involved and on the individual personalities involved. And so if you really want to have something that gets to level five here, level five where development is a core purpose of the organization will have deeply embedded practices and processes that recognize the different cultural meaning making paradigms that are present in the company's day-to-day human-to-human interactions. We, we have as part of the institution methodology a way of looking at common purpose through the lens of biological, social and creative purpose, precisely to factor in those different types of individuals Mm -hmm. who are representative of different types of organisations within that broader ecosystem, Mm -hmm. because until that all gets aligned fully, you can't even begin to engage in anything that is a meaningful progress anywhere. So that, that's a kind of a, you know, it's a, a, a very top line view, but that's what we have in, uh, as part of that. Um, and, and that's where I, I, you know, I know we're having a kind of private conversation here, but that's where I'd like to see those linkages being built and properly understood between what we're doing, what you're doing, what Steve's doing, and, and how that all works, you know, because I think there's a real binding coalition being formed there. Um, anyway. Yes, exactly. No, this is something I'm, I'm keen to dive into. You know, clearly on my side, my work in the world is to bring our methodology for this three axis approach into fully thriving growth. You know, and that's the core that I stand for and where my um, focus is, where my time, my resources go into. And I'm keen to collaborate with people who intersect with that, who have some kind of an interface to that at a greater or larger extent. Um, And what's vital here, none of us has the answer to all of the problems, but all of us have something useful to make progress against many of the problems. So for me, it's absolutely not about, you know, needing to convince everybody that my approach is right. It's all about connecting with, you know, connecting with the full spectrum of people who either say, yes, I absolutely want to do what's in rebuild and only what's in rebuild in the way you see it, all the way through to people who say, well, that's intriguing and there might be something useful in there, but I'm focusing on my stuff We need to move forwards on all of these fronts. And only by doing that do we have a hope in hell of identifying what are the most powerful things to do now, given that we're starting where we are, can only start where we are, to make the journey step by step forwards. I was going to start actually, but I completely forgot. There's a, an old joke I heard off back when I was at university of a tourist who was traveling down a small rural road in the middle of nowhere, completely lost. This was back in the days before GPS, um, completely lost, and eventually came across a farmer standing by the side of the road and stopped and said to the farmer, excuse me, I'm trying to get to this city. And the farmer looked at him and said, oh, If you're trying to get there, I wouldn't start from here. And this is the issue with so many of the competitive arguments between different approaches. For them to work, you would actually need to be starting from a different place to where we are starting now. And then you might be able to do the perfect thing. But at the end of the day, we're starting from where we are. Each of us is starting from where each of us is in the different endeavors we're doing. And the best thing, cheers, Paul. No, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I don't agree with you. We're not starting from where we are. We're starting from where we think we are. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say the same thing, Paul. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so no, asking, no, Graham, no. If we, if we start, we, we can stop and look at where we are and then make a choice about whether that is in fact the right place. It goes back to asking the right questions. It's critical thinking. 
And, and so I kind of agree, I absolutely agree with that, Paul. Notable that you're in Ireland and that, that joke is normally attributed to the Irish, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, I know the farmer who asked it. Yeah, I bet you do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> he lives over there. <laughs> but I think it's an important, it's a really important point. You know, e each of us, I, as, as I understand it, has, has started from a different place, that's for sure. But then we've arrived at some common understandings and there's going to be huge differences in the way that we have arrived at that and how we've dealt with that and so on. But nonetheless, I think the important point is we, we have to start somewhere that isn't here because here is really screwed up. And that's the whole point, isn't it? That's what we're all sort of keen to, to, to address what in our in our various ways. And and many of the problems, you know, as I put in the chat, you know, the things that we identified looking at different cities and, and uh, types of ecosystems that uh, are responsible for social change one way or another was that the monsters were recurring themes. You know, this was something really important. The mon we, we call them monsters. Um, they, they are the things that crop up no matter where you are anywhere in the world, dealing with on the ground issues. They're the same things. And I think, Paul, you mentioned some of these things earlier. You know, ego would be a good example of that, hubris, apathy, uh, this kind of stuff. So we know that there are commonalities, but they manifest in different ways in different types of environments. Nobody, and I'll give you a really little example. There is a part of the city that I live in, which is Oxford in the UK, um, which needs to, uh, or at least the, the need has been to create an integrated community. The need was understood, the funding came for it to various stakeholders in that community, but where the, where the people that I spoke to said, we need to understand what we need to do, and then we need to understand how our capabilities are able to do it. Now, that's the sort of on the ground issue that I'm talking about, you know, where clearly that's wrong. That's broken right from the start, isn't it? That, that way of thinking. So when, when I think about the really important work that you guys are all doing, particularly Graham, around, the, around what you're doing, that's fantastic. But when you're dealing with people that are literally trying to understand how to change a community in a city, for, for the better, but where they don't understand the right questions to ask, and they're only coming at it through the lens that they currently have, then the thing's basically fucked. And so we need to change that. We need to put a, a, a spoke in the wheel, a stick in the wheel, really. Picking up on what you said, um, I think that with what I was saying and your reaction to it, we may well be looking at the same thing from different vantage points. What I was picking up from was best captured by a member of the audience in a talk I gave in London about four years ago in this. He came up to me afterwards and he said, Graham, I'm a civil servant. I sit in lots of talks that begin the way yours does, which was, this is the world we want and this is what we need to do to get that world. And they always have ended, and yours is the first one I've ever been that did not end in the way that the others do. The others always end and say, for that to work, we need new legislation, we need new regulation. <laughs> Dear civil servants, please execute, and then we can start. Yours is the first that said, and this is how we do it from where we are now with existing legislation, with existing regulation. We don't need anything new to start. We just need to start. And I think well, that that's true. with what you were saying, the issue in, for example, if I take British company law, almost none of the corporate lawyers that I have spoken to have actually read what is written in the law. They are all going from the interpretation. They're starting from what they think the law says, not from what the law actually says. And so things like the company is the property of the investors is not in company law anywhere. Mm. It's a construct that has become a belief of what the law means. Yes. But it's a construct that comes from the fact that the, the way companies are structured gives all of the governance power to the people who've put money in. But the law does not say that the company is the property of the investors. 
No, but that's a, that. Sorry, Gren, that's a, that's a construct of the mind, exactly as you say. It's the perception rather than the reality. So the constructs of the mind, I think, probably Paul would agree. That's the bit that needs changing. Voilà. And you can't until you've changed that construct from the mind. You're always going to start from here rather than from where you should. So I completely accept that those sort of Thank pillars. You for that. So uh, what what you're saying is is right. So fiduciary duty. I don't know whether this is what you're referring to, Graham, but fiduciary duty actually says not acting against the broader interests of the beneficiaries. But a lot of people co-opt fiduciary duty to not take uh, the risks that they don't want to take and to do the things that they do. And uh, it's been completely co-opted and interpreted in a, a, um, a, a, an entirely disingenuous way for, for many, many years. And it's sanctioned the most abominable behavior uh, when actually it's saying, not acting against the broader interests of those beneficiaries. So there's been work done. McKinsey did some work and uh, a few others have done work on this. Um, so yeah, just to reinforce what you're saying, uh, Graham. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The other thing, for example, in UK company law, the way that the act is written, it refers to the members of the company, not the shareholders. And it says mem entry, entry of a person into the register of members, it can be done through shareholding, but it does not limit that to the only way of becoming a voting member of the company. And it keeps fully open the option that somebody can become a voting member of the company because they satisfy certain criteria of membership. Yeah, and that was the actually the starting point for the Fair Shares Commons nearly 10 years ago was voting rights based on membership according to certain criteria based on your relationship to the company. And that's still one of the things that you can embed in there. I'm just not doing it to make it a simpler, more practical starting point using existing company law that doesn't depend on that part of UK company law. John, I think you had a finger up. Yeah, I, I, I think probably, I mean, because you know, I mean, I go into the micro level. Um, so this is, this is quite macro, but the micro level for me, this is, this is what we're talking about is, is, is the currency of trust. And what I understand of what Stephen's saying about this is actually somehow or other, the, the, the individuals going along, whatever, the, I can't remember the line is, the axis of there, is to build confidence. So essentially, it, it feels to me a lot of this is about the confidence. The reason the fiduciary people have the confidence is because they've used that currency for so long as the, the basis of confidence and trust. And essentially, the, the, the part that needs changing at this point is people need to be able to walk into the room with people like that and say, what I bring is more valuable than what you have. And I think this is a really key part. And it's, this is, we, you know, um, you know, Graham and I and, and the COP talk about this on Tuesday nights, so certainly I bring this in, is, is that you know, we are, you know, it is the quantum activist. We are the change that we're, you know, we want to see in the world. We are that. We have to work on that. And this just, I mean, essentially, again, this chart says the same thing. If you bring that into a room and you bring that confidence into a room and you change that room, so you, then you just need to be in the right rooms, changing the right people. I mean, that's all that happens. But I mean, I'm, I'm, on my level, I, mean, I work with unpaid work and community service, and I'm a supervisor. I take guys out, and they're there because they're told to. And there's a social construct which has told them, you know, you better show up, and la 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 la. Now, my interest is, can I get those guys to enjoy that work? Because they're not getting paid. No one's really getting paid that much. <laughs> I mean, I'm you know scraping by on it, um, and I can because essentially the social and, the, and the, the, the human capital can change that. That can change that day. And if I can do that enough times, that can actually change quite a lot of things because they then start looking at other ways that they could change. And then that change is happening. And now that change is, 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 is big, but it requires people to show up. I mean, this is what I think is where the individuals forget is we, I need to be in that room making that change. Someone else needs to be in another room making that change. And, and that's really the conversation. It seems to me like Steve, Steve Podmore I mean, you're, you're used to walking into rooms where people have money. And really what it's about for you is if you can make the change where you can walk in and go, well, what Steve Cook's talking about is more important, more valuable than what we're talking about. That changes that room. And I, and I think that's, that's really important at this stage because that's the, the revolution. The revolution is that, I can't pronounce it properly, can I, Paul? <laughs> the, re -re the loving revolution, man. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's it. I really value what you brought in, John, 
because it's it's spot on at the heart of a level five incorporation is trust you know it really is a mechanism to enable trust to happen and the the key thing about that is trust happens because you have a right to be in the room that no other stakeholder can take away you're not there because the powerful investors have condescended to allow you to join the meeting and speak and listen but you actually have the right to be there because you are representing a capital or a stakeholder group that complements the money and the financial investor stakeholder group and so you have the right to be there you're not there because the benevolent dictator has invited you in yeah and yeah. that forms a much more substantial basis for trust than just a, a values level or ethical level agreement that we will collaborate and trust each other mm -hmm. I have to go, but I ran a five-day workshop last week, and we ended up talking about Descartes, who said, I think, therefore, I am. And because we were working with dialogue, we were spinning the collective to operate at a much deeper level. So once we had tuned on that a bit, somebody said, well, if Descartes said, I think, therefore, I am, when we think, therefore, we are. So I'll leave it at that. So <laughs> let us think and we are. See you all soon. Thanks again. Cheers, Paul. Cheers, Paul. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> See you soon, guys. Cheers, Paul. Mm. Hey, can I just say, I, I've got to go as now. Uh, now I stayed a bit longer than I hope, but this has been really good. And um, hopefully we can all uh, reconnect. And uh, Steve, I don't know how long you're staying, but um, uh, I've got to email you, which I'll do later tonight after my session. I've almost uh, finished it. You do. And, uh, Graham, really nice to see you again after all this time. It's uh, really good to see you. And um, yeah, I like the, I'm a simple guy. I think, you know, in the world we need uh, a lot more good and a lot less bad. And we have to, uh, the, the challenge is we, our incentives uh, are currently the opposite. You know, capital concentrates and it is dysfunctional in the way that it's actually deployed. It's not going to where it can have maximum impact and it's not going in the way that it can have maximum impact so you know the bottom line is our institutions and our structures are are not for fit for purpose i think what you've identified um uh, on several level levels is a a neat way of uh, of changing those incentives and processes and practices so uh, again thanks a lot and thanks uh, steve and donna i've got to go thanks steve cheers All right, bye. Yeah. And I'll give you, to, to John's point a bit earlier, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little example. We, we and, and Graham, I may have mentioned this to you before, but John, you might like this. In, in Oxfordshire, we have the highest homeless figures outside central London in the UK. Mm. And we, which is surprising in itself. People don't think that that would be the case. But we also have 42 charities devoted to homelessness. Mm. And so when the Community Foundation in Oxfordshire was given vast amounts of money at the start of the first lockdown in Oxfordshire to then divest out to all the charities that needed it, which was all the charities, obviously, they then was, were dividing that money up across 42 charities without anybody. And I did a whole load of analysis that said to reduce the homeless figures in Oxfordshire, we need three homeless charities, not 42. So the question then becomes, do you give same pot of money, do you give that to three or to 42? Who's gonna make the best use? And so the work that I did, and again, John, John Graham knows this, but I spent uh, 10 years just looking at Oxfordshire, just to understand the disconnects between various forms of civil society organizations, governments and business in the county to understand what those gaps were. And I then annotated that house across 46 cities worldwide to, to look at the differences in the gaps and how and that I call those gaps the monsters. So the point was, and, and somebody said this to me, and forgive the expletive, somebody said to, to me yesterday, stop, and, I, and I'm used to swearing, I swear quite a lot, I'm afraid, but somebody said to me please, yesterday- Please, stop please messing. continue, um, Steve. And just as a, 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 actually I'm gonna stop recording now, I'm not going to keep recording going, but just as a side comment, um, 
I really like it if somebody uses the language that is most appropriate from where they are without apologizing for using that language. So you know, my invitation to you is use whatever language expresses as cleanly as you want to express it, what you want to say. Well, I went on to a Zoom call last week with a, a really big name in, in social capital. He looks a bit like Joe Biden. I said to my wife, I've got to be really careful not to swear because that would be like swearing in front of my granddad. And the first thing he said to me from America was the not-for-profit sector is fucked. <laughs> that was his first. And <laughs> so I thought, fine, great. You know, now I have freedom. But but but, um, but I but I think the that you know I'm not going to hear. I'm not here to hog the show. But the thing that really struck me in Oxfordshire was that when the ecosystems get created within the charity sector, and everybody goes hooray and hurrah, you're doing wonderful mm -hmm. things, and they are, and that's fantastic. And I was a volunteer deliver food delivery driver for a year in my county throughout 2020 and so on. And they're doing amazing work. The problem is that the wastage there is enormous. Mm -hmm. But everybody talks about the things that they're doing well, not the things that they're not. And so, of course, with it, and, and I'm just sharing my pain with yeah. you because all the charities, and I know many, many charities in, in the UK and particularly in Oxfordshire, but all of them, of course, and we know this, are desperately trying to gain more money, mostly from philanthropy, where the philanthropy tends to lead to people, exactly, where the, where, the, where the philanthropy tends to lead people having seats on the boards of charities, a lot of whom are too mm -hmm. small to cope with that type of trusteeship. Mm -hmm. um, and that then skews their operational direction, but it also skews their interrelationships with other mm -hmm. types of organizations from business and, and governments in, in local yeah. areas. And so we start to see, and this is kind of going back to my very earliest point, and Graham, why I'm so thrilled about all that you're doing and why I really want to progress these things. Yeah, I want to progress these things on. But when you start to look at how those disconnects manifest themselves, mm -hmm. where the protectionism and separatism comes into play as a result, mm -hmm. and then start to look at how the shutters come down, apart from when they need to be open to acquire money, mm -hmm. which then immediately screws everything up. Mm -hmm. Hence my point about the integrated community in, in a part of Oxford. You know, we, we, we have a thriving city that glorifies the things that Oxford is great for, and that's fair. But as I said in a, in a presentation I did early last year, early in 2020, we, Oxford shouldn't be judged by its world leading university and its wonderful science and tech innovation and its thing and its thing and its thing and its Lenin Palace and all the rest of it. It should be judged on how we change the systems that prevent us solving our problems mm. on the world stage. We should be more famous for that, for that than anything we've ever done before. And I think this is true everywhere that I've ever worked in terms of how to bring type parts of community together, parts of society together, the same rules apply. And mm -hmm. so the idea of taking this ecosystem and the uh, fair shares commons, changing the dynamic so that you don't just have clusters of charities, you have mm -hmm. charities, businesses and local government people. I mean, actually to the point of having them in the same building, literally put them in the same space. Yeah. I call them pop-up coalitions, put them into the same space where they are forced to have conversations with each other around the water cooler or the coffee machine or whatever, rather than having conversations within with people that only of their own kind, charities. Mm -hmm. So if you just like, look at a small business center, it's full of people who are business people, isn't it? It's a business center, mm -hmm. that's that. So the conversations around the water cooler are all about what it's like to be a startup business or why they can't get enough funding or how they're gonna increase sales or whatever it might be. If you interjected somebody from a charity, into that conversation, they'd initially be going, I, I don't understand a word you're saying. Mm -hmm. This does not relate to me. But then you suddenly realize, and this is the work that I did, that it's all entirely interrelated because we're all entirely interdependent. Mm. Yes. Oof, there's a lot in there. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. I'm, no, I'm, no, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's why I'm going. I mean, I'm going to pop back to. When I, I lived in Oxford briefly when I was 18, when I got thrown, thrown out of school and had to go and do my A-levels there and was yeah, there. Excellent. And I remember talking to a homeless guy there and he said, we all come to Oxford in winter because it's got the best charities. 
yeah, there you go. Because they all came out of London. They came out of London in the winter, had the best shelters and they had the best secondhand clothes. And so they all Absolutely. so they transferred yeah. themselves over. And I think that goes all the way back to when um, George Orwell was, you know, hopping around the place, to, you know, or probably beyond. Um, but yeah, th that, um, oh, all of that. I mean, the power bases in terms of the philanthropies, the, the, the petty kind of, well, not, the, but the, the, the competition within the ecosystem for philanthropic funds. Oh, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I like one, of the, one of the other things I'm involved in is a band of brothers, which is a sociocratic circle made up for, for um, the criminal justice system and things like that. And it's going through a bit of this at the moment, sociocratic in theory and all the circles meeting, but then they formed a hub because they got a big old grant from the Ministry of Justice. And now suddenly, oh, let's form an organizational center that does all this. And now we've got, a, we've got circles that I'm still part of where there are guys meeting and just like, you know, sod the lockdown, we're going to meet, this is what we're about, we're wild men, we go into the woods, blah, 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 and you've got the hub going, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, we might lose our grants, you know, and, and this whole kind of conflict, and of course the guys are in the circles of the guys who actually came through the criminal justice, the care system, you know, a couple of them are working with Warm Up the Homeless down in Eastbourne, all these guys, so it, it's, it's almost like, how do you get all of that infrastructure, because you do need those people at the hub. You need that level of organization. You need that level of skills and bureaucratic skills and how to deal with big organizations. But it's how to hold the powers so that they don't then quash. And, you know, at the moment, what this, I'm concerned, go on. This is where the change comes in. So when, when I was working with the UK Community Foundations, I'm sure it'd be, there are 46 of them in the UK, one pretty much for every county. Um, and I, I wrote the foundation piece for the, that became the UK Civil Society Strategy. Yeah. So I was working with, with, with you know, that sort of senior level. And, um, and when, but when I was looking at the community foundations and I was talking with the chair of the Oxfordshire one as part of that work, and we were talking about philanthropy. And of course, and I call these people the usual suspects because of course he was sitting there saying, oh yeah, so I'm off out to dinner with Fox and Smythe Fox and <laughs> thing. And, uh, and so it went on. And I said, yeah, but the richest person in Oxfordshire Who's a, who's a billionaire businessman who, who I know is the person that sent me an email, there's another swear word here, the person that sent me an email saying, I just love it when the establishments are left standing in the dust saying to themselves, how the fuck did they do that? When change is affected. You know, and this is the person, it's the unusual suspects that you need to go and talk to because they won't give you philanthropy, money in that context. They will give it to you with a whole load of other much better types of strings attached yeah. notably you actually have to do the job <laughs> yeah um and i think no. yeah i mean that's what ties in with grand stakeholders you've now got a stakeholder you've got it, someone who's going on the journey with you not someone who's like dropping absolutely. something out of the back of their bag and and you know up, up from behind the sofa it, and, and leaving you with that you know it's it's yeah absolutely I and mean, there's a really interesting way and graham i don't know if you've been looking at this but um my my eldest daughter is uh, is a chartered accountant and she joined a chat and accountancy charity and they sent her out to Uganda, Cambodia, she was in various places around the world to create financial due diligence within very, very small charities in those countries. Yeah. And she was doing things like showing an individual girl how to create an Excel spreadsheet when that girl was the only person responsible for the finances of a tiny charity dealing with women who'd been raped and then, and then had children, okay, in, in Cambodia. So that was just one example. But where in that scenario, the philanthropy, and she was telling me about this, really is somebody will come along with $100. Mm. And they won't just give the $100 to that charity because they believe it to be a good cause. They will give that money uh, and say, you are to buy a computer mm -hmm. or you are to buy a desk mm -hmm. or you are to buy a thing. And this is so low grade, but so mm -hmm. vital. And unless that charity is able 12 months down the line to show that, uh, that investor, if you wish, mm -hmm. uh, that they bought that computer with that hundred dollars, they won't get another hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this need for you know, this is tiny, tiny micro level stuff. But if you times that out by every charity in Cambodia or Oxfordshire or, or the UK or wherever, if you look at that diligence and that requirement to deliver, you change the game yeah. fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. A thought I'd like to put in, and I'll, I'll tie together something you said right at the beginning and what you've just said now. 
this i i believe that a big driver behind that level of micromanagement is coming about because we have this fundamental misunderstanding of business processes in a world where luck plays a big role mm -hmm. point one point two this is tied into your statement early on, I think you said that you have 46 homeless charities in the Oxford area and a study came back and said you needed three. Well, I would pose the, uh, the question to explore how much of that statement of three is coming again from thinking that the world behaves differently to the way it actually behaves and therefore having a strategy like the unicorn strategy in venture capital of saying we have to put everything behind the one or two or three that become big, not recognizing that the only reason why they became big was because they had a, a row of lucky heads early on in their cycle, not recognizing the role that luck plays. So I would put to you as a hypothesis what if what you really need, and I'll say why in a moment, what if what you really need is not just 46 charities, but maybe 460 charities, but all of them interlocked and interrelated into a single ecosystem of charities that is highly collaborative and sharing, you know, it, that it has common metabolic pathways and common DNA, and the final thing I'll say is one of the big things in evolution, Darwin said, asked the question, why on earth are there so many beetles? We have thousands of beetles and nature only needs a couple of hundred to do the job that beetles are there to do. And there are reasons why there are so many beetles that come from the difference between this graph and this graph. And so I throw that to your, in your direction as something to... That, so, so in theory, Graham, you, you're absolutely right. I completely understand that. And that's, but, but the problem is precisely because of that Venn diagram that I've shared with you before. I have, I have three circles, uh, John, business government and civil society and a sweet spot in the middle, which is systemic social change. Right. If you create... 460 instead of 46 or instead of three homelessness charities in Oxfordshire. Let's imagine we, we did that. And let's imagine that we manage the way in which that money, so I wanna take money out of the equation in a minute, but, but let's imagine that the funding for all those charities was all in place. The governance was there, the diligence was there, the ecosystem from a financial perspective ran well. We still have the really big problems uh, so th again, this is something I, I said only last week, and, and you, you'll recognize this. Every charity should exist to make itself redundant, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. It should exist to put itself out of business. Mm -hmm. We, we understand. Poetic. But none of them do. Yeah. None of them do that. The, Sorry, the way that they are designed, the charities are typically designed down here or here. They're at level one or level two. And so if you haven't built in to the fundamental design along this axis, the capacity for autopoiesis, they cannot do it, number one. Number two, if they're not at level four or five here in terms of opening up people's internal capacity to see what is, they lack the individuals lack the internal capacity as individuals to see that possibility and to see that issue and they lack the capacity to interact in such a way to bring that to life if you think of what i said the difference between this simulation and this one uh, is this on, one Graham. is maximizing the relationships you the program, connections Graham, between you're, fr you're frozen so uh... Uh, are you, are you showing are you showing us the um, coin toss data again? Oh, he's gone. He's that. 
<laughs> oh, I'm, that's that. The world is over. <laughs> it's, it's, it's auto poeticized. Um, but, I, but I, yeah, I, you know, I think I think the point is when you look at um, all of the other components. Sorry, Graham, you, yeah. you carry on your back. Yes, I'm back again. So I was just saying there, if you're in, if you if you are in a portfolio, you're basically ignoring all of the connections between the different companies or entities in the portfolio, mm -hmm. and you're optimizing according to each individual entity in isolation. But if the connections, the relationships between those entities are actually important, that is going to lead to unpredictable and harmful outcomes if you optimize without taking into account the connections. Yes. And so, I, what I'm pointing at here is a bit like your reply to the folk who said, well, we need to look at what's available and what we can do with what's available. Um, I, I have a, an intuition that what you're dealing with there has a lot of common ground with what I'm looking at here from the perspective of investment portfolio. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that if, and my concern listening to some of the things that you were saying was that you, I was hearing, I was not hearing enough about how do we see all of the ways that the different players, entities are in relationship to each other and how do we optimize at the connections, the lines joining the dots level to have the best possible chance of achieving the outcomes we're after. Well, that you didn't see, you didn't hear me talk about that because I didn't. Um, but that is the, exactly what the institution methodology is. That that's precisely what it is. It, it's that diagnosis mm -hmm. of all of those interconnections, all those interplays, all those disconnections. It, it's basically me as a 35 years into my career, strategist working within very complex organizations, deciding to transport that same way of thinking, way of working as, as a strategist, but across different types of organizations. So step one, really, really basic. So guys, what's our sense of individual purpose? Purpose is central to, to my universe, but you know, what, what's our, and you'll see the disconnects. They, they are all disconnected. So how do we change that? Well, you only change that by asking a different question from the off, you know. So the homeless charity will say our purpose is to resolve homelessness, but it isn't, <laughs> you know. So you, you've got to start asking, oh, yes, it's to do a part of that job for sure, but it's always short term and it's always remedial, you know, at their purpose. So anyway. Two things I just want to put in. Um, inside the book, there's a section called the purpose problem. Have a look at that. It points at what is the shadow side of being really purpose oriented and why that is a problem. The other thing I would suggest, it might be helpful to analyze your institution methodology across these, at least the first four layers, maybe layer stratum five as well. Yeah, this is all about what are my internal connections between the different parts of myself, the connections between us as human beings, mm -hmm. the connections within the company to do work, the connections between the different stakeholders in the, in the operation, and then the connections between different companies or organizations. So that's the connections mm -hmm. between stakeholders in a company and the mm -hmm. connections in between companies in a local ecosystem and then there's the global ecosystem the, the connections between local ecosystems mm -hmm. and i have a suspicion and this is a another bigger topic of conversation i have a suspicion that your institution approach is very strong at levels one or two maybe is doing something in stratum three and needs fundamentally new stuff at stratum four to enable it to work, these four strata, those two form the human axis in my three dimensions. This one is the work axis and that's the incorporation axis. 
So these four strata are an alternative lens to look at what is otherwise in this diagram through. Yeah. Um, so your part writes in that we haven't, okay. So, so institution is made up, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, but John, you're still here. Unstitution mm. is made up of three methodologies. One of which is mine, which mm. has existed for a long, long time. Okay, for 35 years based on conduct, how mm. we conduct ourselves as organizations, ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera, how we do that. The second one is based on the, those bottom three of that model. So predominantly around purpose. So one of them is organizational. The second one is purpose led. And the third part is, as I think I said to you before, red team thinking. So this is really critical, mission critical, military grade, because mm. that's where it was born thinking where where it's kind of brutal in a way the purpose mm. sort of end the human end and the red team thinking end end cap the entire methodology because one's kind of brutal because it's mission critical and the other one isn't and conduct sits in the middle so you are you are wrong with respect in in, in that we don't cover off all of those points but you are right in that we haven't yet reached a point where we can articulate that as succinctly as a as a continuum and as a complete ecosystem in itself. Can, I ask, still been... can I ask quickly? Are you are you there to eliminate homelessness in Oxfordshire, or are you there to try and take care of the people who are homeless in Oxfordshire? No, we're not. We're neither. We're there to change. Uh, 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 so it's not, we're not in Oxfordshire. We, we um, so I started this ten years ago by looking at what I knew was wrong that systemic change was required, okay? Mm -hmm. And I had drawn that conclusion off the back of working with all these different types of big organizations worldwide. Mm -hmm. So really big businesses and central governments all over the world and massive charities and civil society and academia and so on. And I arrived at a point where I thought, okay, I know that it's profoundly wrong, but I don't know what it is and how it manifests itself in detail. So I took the view that I would forensically look at my home county. Mm. Out of everywhere I'd worked in, I'd been in Chicago and Mumbai and worked in New York and San Francisco and Sydney and Shanghai and all over the world. But I thought, okay, I'll I'll look at my home county. Can I just and was it mostly charity work? Charity charity work. Oh, okay. No, no. So okay. so my work always pretty much equal split between business. So I work with people like Siemens, Salesforce, Microsoft, Google, right. uh, you know, big, big uh, Mercedes-Benz, Pfizer, people like that. I've historically right. were those big organizations, but also governments and big charities and small charities, also Oxfam, Amnesty right. International, I've worked with globally. So right. all my work historically has been global. So I decided to then bring all of that global, big scale knowledge mm -hmm. down into my home county. Right. And I spent 10 years just looking at my home county and, you know, really simple things like looking at the minutes over six years for the Oxfordshire Strategic Partnership. This okay. is the organisation brought together to define the future of the county. Right. And I looked at every minute, quarterly minutes for six years. The most boring, yeah. So I, you know, getting into, and I, and I became, <laughs> just, yeah, Gra Graham knows this. You know, I became known as the bloke in the hat. I mean, nobody knew who I was. I didn't know mm. my home county. I'd right. lived in Berlin. I'd lived in, in Brussels for a while. I'd lived in mm. Paris, Seattle, but I'd never lived really in my home county. I didn't know anybody. Right. So I was this sort of unknown bloke just roaming around the, the county. Sticking his finger into lots of different places where I should, probably shouldn't have done, and I just built this understanding over over yeah. that ten year period. You know, I am a strategist. It's the way my brain works. I think I see things in patterns and links and or lack of links. And so by the end of 2019, I sort of arrived at a point where I thought, okay, not only do I now understand this, but I have also tested the theories in other places around the world, notably like Paris and Houston, places like that, because I knew people in those places. And from that was built the methodology. So that was the point. End of 2019, I went to Oxfordshire leadership and said, and again, Graham's heard all this before, but I, but I basically did a series of talks and a series of presentations to, to the great and the good, in the county and the great and the good all said oh my god you're amazing you're fantastic you're brilliant in every regard you are an absolute mm. genius but you've been too ambitious and it'll never happen in terms of what was required in terms of systemic change for the county 
and there were a whole load of things around that. So of course that that crushed me. And then I put my shoulder to it and thought, okay, if I can't create this in my home county, I shall go to all the people I know around the world and I shall create the methodology with them. And that, that's what I did. In fact, somebody the other day asked, and I, somebody asked me, um, now that I've built all this, now it's been tested everywhere but Oxfordshire, <laughs> am I going to bring it back into the county? Somebody oh, asked me that. Yes. <laughs> and, and I basically said, fuck Oxfordshire. Oh. So, <laughs> well, because no, I, I, I meant I didn't mean that, but you know, no, there was a part of me that was pretty peaked, you know, after doing all that work yeah. for a long time and engaging with lots of people who all wanted me to do all kinds of things. Yeah. I'll, I'll break out brilliant, Graham. Thank you yeah. so much for that. I, I think there's a mountain of stuff, as we said before, that we can talk about. Mm. Lovely to meet with you, Jonathan. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, you too. And, Steve. Um, Hopefully we'll be able to catch up again. again. Yeah. <laughs>